We're in Trieste this morning, just across from Venice in the northern part of the Adriatic, and the reason for that is the fact that Prestige has launched its M8. Now that's the second boat in its new Powercat line, and here it is, just behind me. Quite a dramatic looking thing. Now we saw the launch of the M48 earlier this year, and that was impressive. Gave you the space of a 60 footer in a 48 foot boat. This adopts the same principle, so it's 65 feet in length, and the idea is that it gives you the space, the volume, the luxury of an 85 footer. That's why they called it the M8. So they will probably, they say, change the name of the M48 to the M6. And then once those two boats are in place, an M7 will also be coming at some point in the future. But for now, it's all about this, the M8. And it's a really quite impressive looking boat, more so than the M48, I would say. So this helm station up here on the flybridge being in the centre of the deck is not actually that sociable. We've got the cabin on one side, we've got the stairwell on the other, we've got the galley built into the aft end of these uh, helm seats just behind us there. Um, so the only people you can actually see are down on the foredeck or at the leading edge of that dining table on the port side. So it's not an especially sociable helm, but it's certainly a very comfortable one. Now, as I say, there are no uh, engine options with this boat. We get D8 600s, a pair of those 7.7 litre inline sixes. Um, and 1200 horsepower in total, that's not a great deal of power for a boat that uh, weighs in excess of 40 tonnes, more like 53 tonnes fully loaded. We've got 17 people on board here today as well. Um, but I'm told that the Mark Lombard hulls, they're extremely efficient. This is a displacement boat, of course, uh, and that we should be capable of getting close to, if not just beyond 20 knots. So let's pop it on a single lever and let's get her underway and see how she performs. Now she's wide beam, of course, very wide beam. As I say, 29 feet, about 45% of the overall length, which is extremely wide. They've gone for stability to compensate for the extra elevation. And right from the off, of course, you feel the benefits of those twin hulls, arrow straight tracking, very, very stable. What we'll do is push straight on at the outset to 20 knots, see if we can get there. And as we do so, I mean, this is a almost mirror flat day today. As we do so, it's worth talking about that bridge deck because of course we've got loads of volume down below. But actually, the clearance under that bridge deck is about a metre. And on a uh, 20 metre boat, that's about 5% of the overall length. That is a decent bit of clearance. So even if we had a few swells about, you would hope that you would avoid those wave shapes interacting with the underside of the hull because what you don't want, and what we saw a little bit on the M48, was those wave shapes hitting that bridge deck, creating a little high pressure zone and sending out puffs of spray that covered the foredeck and a little bit of the flybridge as well. That's obviously not ideal. And this actually is a category A boat, this. And with that bridge deck clearance, it ought to be a decent sea boat too. Certainly, I feel no prospect at all here of interacting with those water shapes at all. There's extra bow buoyancy as well in the uh, bow shapes here. So the bows stay relatively elevated. And here we go. We're doing 20.3, 20 20.4 20 knots now. 20.7. That's pretty good going. At that kind of speed, we're drinking about uh, 12 litres per nautical mile. And we got uh, a pair of 1850 litre tanks, that's 3,700 litres. So with 700 litres redundancy in the system, you're working with 3,000 litres and you can expect a good 250 nautical mile range out of that. 
So that's pretty good, that's a decent range indeed. And if we settle her back down a little bit towards a more realistic cruising speed, down to around about 10 knots, you'll see that the range really extends then. Yeah, 10 knots, we're looking at about five liters per nautical mile, so we're looking at 600 nautical miles. And if we just drop it a tiny bit more, and you get really big returns, around about eight knots now. We're seeing just, wow, we're seeing just 20 odd liters per hour. That's 2.5 liters per nautical mile. Now let's just get her back up to pace and throw her through a few turns. Now, of course, what we're not gonna see is any heel widely spaced holes. What we do see, and what you'd expect to see, is real security. A very serene kind of helming experience. It's very stable, it's very easy. Exactly like the M48 in fact, but more so. This is designed to be a kind of home from home, not a performance machine. So no, you don't get the pickup, you don't get the outright pace. But what you do get is comfort. What you do get is refinement. And what you also get on this boat is the capacity to cruise long distances between destinations. And that puts this boat in an altogether different category to its little sister. If we just take a walk along here, you'll see these really dynamic windows, these hull windows, scepter-like, kind of a pickle fork shape. It looks fantastic, really cool. And actually one of the reasons I found the M48 a bit prosaic looking was the fact that it used freestanding furniture up on the foredeck. Well here, with extra beam and length, they got extra depth too, so they're able to sink that seating as we'll see in a minute. So that looks a lot cooler too. And another way actually in which it differentiates itself a little from the M48, is the fact that although the M48 was quite beamy, this is extra beamy. As I say, a 65 foot boat, it's got a 29 foot beam. If we come around the back, you get a full sense of that. And that's about 45% of the overall length compared to about 41% for the M48. So it really is a hell of a beam, almost as big as you might expect on a sailing cat. So that's quite an impressive thing. And at the aft end here, it's immediately very, very impressive. It's the same principle as the M48, three part um, aft platforms. So independent swim platforms on either side, and then a central section that lifts and drops. But this is particularly impressive here. Firstly, because this platform sits right up flush with the deck level in the cockpit. So you can extend your party out over the water. Then if you drop it down to water level, it's an extension to these peripheral swim platforms give you a, it gives you a, a really impressive kind of beach club setup. And you can drop it again below the water level and a ladder integrated into the back of that takes you down into the water. So it's ideal for swimming, also for launch and retrieval of your uh, tender. And it's big enough, they say, for a 500 kilo tender, anything up to about 4.2 meters. So it's really quite versatile. And of course, when you drop that right down, there is a big locker behind there for you to uh, stow all your various water toys. Because of course, water toys is an important part of the uh, experience on a boat of this sort of scale. So it's big enough to swallow all kinds of things. And we can't actually uh, get in there today because it's full of stuff they need for this boat, which is shortly gonna be shown to some clients, I think. So we've gotta be relatively quick, but we'll step straight on board now onto this port side and make our way up into the cockpit. Once we're in here, you see the full scale of that beam. And you really feel the full scale of that because we have devices like this. A nice narrow steel strut to hold up the aft end of that flybridge rather than big thick fiberglass stanchions that block your route. They've also used a uh, right angled set of steps to access the flybridge from back here. On the M48, it's a longer shallower kind of uh, stairwell. This works well though, opens up a bit of extra space and beneath that we have the third helm position, you'll see just under there. And a little ice maker beneath that so you can serve cold drinks to your guests on these uh, 
seats over here. And of course these seats in line with the M48, they're freestanding, Italian made, very beautiful in their own right. Less costly, less weighty, less complex than uh, fixed mouldings. Of course you do sacrifice storage capacity and storage versatility, but there's so much storage elsewhere on this boat that it hardly matters. And as if to prove that point, we'll have a little look under here. And this gives you access to that toys locker via the back door. We'll just jump down inside to show you the kind of scale of it. As I say, it's full of other gear at the moment, but it's huge. Easily big enough for your stand-up paddle boards, your kayaks, your sea bobs, your dive gear, whatever you want to pop in here, no problem at all. It's a huge size and nice regular shape, so it's great. There's no electrical or mechanical gear to get in your way. Now while we're looking under these deck hatches, let's just open up this uh, engine hatch on the port side because the engine bays were a bit of a bone of contention on the M48. Very big and spacious as you'd expect, but on the M48 the engines were covered with a false floor, a plywood partition over the top which enabled you to store all sorts of gear in there on top. But obviously that's not a great idea if you need access to your engines. So here they remedied that. We've got a pair of D6, or D8 I should say, D8 600s. That's the only engine choice and they're on V drives as you can see. So there's loads of space spare for storage elsewhere. More so in the starboard hull actually because we have a big generator down there. But it's nice and clean, quite cavernous. And if you want you can put your uh, washing machine and tumble dryer down here as well. At the moment on this uh, boat number one they're beneath the saloon deck, as we'll see in a second. But if you want to spec solar panels, then they have to be replaced in that particular locker with batteries. We'll have a look at that in a moment. First though, once we've drunk in the loveliness of this cockpit, in fact, we'll do that by taking a seat and facing aft, because as you look aft, we've got glass balustrades. Even when shut, that feels open but there's a huge section in the centre there that opens right up. So it's kind of like an infinity deck. It's just lovely. It takes you right out over the water and get rid of this and you can actually use that as a dive platform as well. It's a lovely feature, really extends your cockpit. And as I say, for me, I think that freestanding furniture works pretty well here. So let's get our way forward along these side decks. And again, look at this. You've got openness everywhere you look. The views are fantastic. There's nothing to get in your way. These side decks aren't enormous, but they're certainly big enough. And it suggests that when you get into the saloon, you're going to get tremendous breadth. But up on this foredeck, well, the breadth up here is fantastic too. And this sun pad is easily big enough for six people, I would suggest. And then further forward, here's our sunken bow lounge. Uh, sadly, because it's early in the morning, the cushions that would have been here around these two sides are not there. But we do have the forward-facing bench. If I get down to a low level, you can feel how wonderfully intimate that is. It's just lovely. Sinking, it totally changes the dynamic. You've got wonderful views all round. But it doesn't ruin the profile of the boat. As I say on the M48, there's a flat foredeck, so the freestanding furniture they used there was right up and out and in your eye line. And it looked a bit odd, but this is fantastic. Of course, because they dropped that bridge deck a bit, we've got a very easy to use anchor locker up here. And beneath my feet, we have extra space for the chain down there and also should you want it, space for your fenders, plus additional fender lockers here. So the seamanship practicalities are very well taken care of. Now what I really like about this cockpit and this saloon and the way they interact is the fact that we've got a central unit here, a service bar that looks out to service this aft cockpit. And then we've got uh, symmetrical doors, big sliding patio doors on both sides. So the integration between these spaces, inside and outside, is absolutely fantastic. What I also like is the fact that we've got single level decks all the way through. <clears throat> now Prestige has worked pretty hard on that. And a lot of sailing cats where you've got to be wide and low. The uh, need for headroom down below kind of compromises the shape and scale of your 
saloon and your decks, but uh, here they've raised the main deck to add in lots of extra headroom down below, and they've kept this entirely single level. They then raised the fly deck as well, so there's decent elevation, but everything is single level on these two decks. Loads of deck space to play with, and loads of headroom down below. And they can do that because it's a power cat, and because they can just compensate for the extra elevation with a bit of extra beam, and that's exactly what they've done with that 29 foot beam. So loads of stability, loads of space, loads of volume, and really beautifully arranged on the basis of what I'm seeing here on boat number one. We step into that saloon, and it's not just relying on volume to impress. There's some lovely design features in here, lovely asymmetry. We've got central furniture that causes you to kind of zigzag around it, adds a bit of interest. And we've got an asymmetrical layout forward as well as aft. But first, before we get to that, here's this central service bar. If we come here, we've got a, uh, a sink under there and a nice little wine fridge there, plus I think at the moment we've got storage in here, yeah, but you can also spec that with uh, additional ice makers or fridges. And it looks straight out onto that half cockpit. So that's a really lovely piece of design that. And there's glass on the sides as well, you see. No solid bulkheads, they want the light to bounce around, they want it to feel open, and it really does. We've got a little lounge on the starboard side with excellent access to those side decks. We've got more freestanding furniture, another lounge seat on the port side, plus an additional one here in the centre, and a little coffee table with units. Of course, you can spec whatever fabrics and styles you like. The options list is huge. What I really like here is the fact that they've tried so hard with this internal staircase to reach the flybridge. I mean, that's great if you've got crew, of course, to go from the lower helm up to the top. But it's quite a design feature in its own right. Lovely geometric shapes, lots of glass, lots of stainless steel. A nice curve as well to those steps as they lead up and round. 180 degree curve. And it looks superb, it looks like an art installation. And as I say, there's light everywhere, views everywhere. It's very cool. And as if to reinforce the idea that this is a stable boat, they've even popped a, uh, a turntable on here with, I think, quite a plush yeah, separate amplifier unit down below. And a little bit of Edith PF, why not? What's really cool here though, and I'll mention this before I forget it, because it's uh, quite low profile and you don't quite realize it's there, is that to mirror that uh, stairwell on the port side, we have this unit, and you think, well, what's that for? Actually, that's your day heads, which is really quite impressive. If we come around here to this uh, forward dining area, there's the galley on the starboard side. There are options there, we'll talk about that in a sec. There's another door onto the side deck here on the port side. And if we pop out there and nip round, this is your day head. So that is super cool. Really private, tucked away. You wouldn't actually know it's there. And of course that frees up the accommodation down below and the en suites to remain entirely private. Now let's step back into this saloon and have a look at the forward section. As I say, it's not a step up, it's all single level. Here's the dining station for six on the port side. If I just slide that chair forward a little um, and open up this hatch beneath the floor, you'll see here's the washer and dryer down in this deep, deep recess. And that's where you put your uh, battery banks if you want solar panels on the hard top so you don't have to run a generator when you're at anchor, so that makes good sense. And as I say, there's plenty of space in the engine rooms to relocate those uh, washers and dryers. And over here, well, the galley is it's a very impressive space, I have to say, but there are options. And the same goes for the helm station, which kind of masquerades as a cabinet, very low profile. What we see here is called the control station. Now, this is optional. This basically gives you throttles and a bit of steerage through your uh, joystick, plus some decent screens. It's pretty much in the centre of the deck, as is the helm on the uh, flybridge. And on a big beamy boat, it can be quite tough to understand exactly where the parameters of the boat are, particularly on the 
starboard side actually with this galley in place because we've got that big full height fridge freezer and then we've got these high level cabinets up top which seem to me entirely unnecessary actually because we also have some good cabinets built in further forward so if it were me I'd get my screwdriver out I think and simply take these off so you've got a better view to the starboard side but either way we also have uh, Garmin surround view here on this boat so you can see the parameters of the boat properly whether you're down here up on the fly or on that uh, third helm station on the port side of that cockpit but you can of course if you want and you boat in northern Europe or Britain spec this as a proper helm station with a single seat and a slightly elevated dash. Now you can of course relocate this galley downstairs to the aft cabin on the starboard side and reduce your sleeping accommodation and then replace this up here with lounge seating which of course opens up your views a bit. But for me, given how much lounge seating there already is on this main deck and on the fly for that matter, it makes sense to have the galley up here in the perfect place to service all these various socialising zones. And also, by having it up here, it does enable you to spec as many as five cabins to sleep ten people. And that's not including those two forward crew cabins. So that in itself is likely to be very attractive to some people. Before we take a look at those cabins though, let's pop straight up by this art installation of a staircase and take a look at what the flybridge has to offer. Now as I say, central helm, two beautiful high grade seats there, steering position on the port side, relatively compact dash. But everything you need, throttles and the joystick in the centre, big MFDs. And this is the Garmin surround view I was talking about. We've tried this out in the past. It's a really effective system. It enables you to see the parameters of your boat really clearly. So you can bring it alongside wherever you happen to be helming from. And as I say, on a, a boat of, uh, of this kind of scale, with a 29 foot beam, a 65 foot boat, it's a really handy system. Now from here, we have lovely views out over that foredeck. Behind us here we have a transverse galley and on the port side we have another big dining station for at least eight people, another couple of chairs, you could easily sit ten there. And above us, this is an option, we've got a big concertina soft top sunroof so you can drench this upper deck in light. And Let's pop round and have a look at this galley unit. We've got uh, electric grills under here, a pair of those plus a small sink and additional refrigeration and storage there. We also have a secondary unit here with another work surface, additional storage and of course you can spec that with ice makers and fridges if you like. On the starboard side we have a long sunbed with storage underneath that and on the aft part of the deck, there's the access point from the cockpit. On the aft part of this deck, again, we've got lots of space and freestanding furniture. Nice see-through rails, nothing to block your view back here. And it's at this point that the hard top ends, but you can, of course, extend that with the sunshade over this aft section, so you can manage your sun during the day so you don't get too hot. But as on the lower deck, this feels fantastically open. It's a very pleasant place to be. Some, I think, may quibble with design-heavy detailing like these blue strings woven into the uh, aft end of the cabinet. But as I say, there are loads and loads of fabrics and styles and designs you can pick from for this boat. Because they're basically trying to move themselves up towards the higher echelons, towards even the super yacht market. And when you're playing with a market like that you need to have as many options as possible so people can really make a boat feel quite bespoke, quite unique, quite personal. Now let's get down to those cabins, we'll start with the starboard side. The layout's actually nice and simplistic, easy to understand. The stairwell comes down to the bottom here and is split on either side. We have a cabin forward and a cabin aft. And let's look at the forward cabin first. Here we have a pair of beds, one above the other, moving inboard into that sort of bridge deck space beneath the uh, saloon deck. Beneath that upper bed, we have some really good storage under there. They make every inch of that four and a half space count here. Lighting's quite pleasant too. It's not spacious, but it's very comfortable. 
the ideal for three kids, three relatively small kids. And we have great views from there too. Big window, nice and deep. And in the forward part, ahead of this cabinet on the starboard side, we have the ensuite facilities. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the headroom down here. Fantastic headroom throughout. It doesn't dip at any stage at all. Big separate shower there. A lot of people will want a nice big rain shower rather than just the handheld unit, but it's certainly an impressive space. Quite nicely trimmed too. Not too ostentatious. Which is always a temptation, I think, when people move towards the super yacht market. And in this aft cabin, this is where the galley will be if you spec the galley down. We have a more conventional double with cabinets on either side of the bed, a mirror above the bed head to bounce the light around. And this one is transverse, so you face directly out through those windows to get a fantastic view from the bed. And there's really good height above that bed as well. Like I say, headroom's fantastic here, so you can easily sit up in bed and read. And further aft, there's the ensuite facilities for this double. Now this is kind of the standard layout. Two cabins in either hull, both en suite, and both very private because of course we have that dedicated day head on the main deck. But if we pop over to the port side, you'll discover that there are options here again. Quite rewarding options actually, because rather than specking two cabins in this port hull, what we have here is a really impressive VIP suite so we come down to the bottom of this stairwell and there are no bulkheads here. It's all entirely open right the way across because we have a raised double in the aft section there, which pretty much mirrors what we see in the other hull. In place of the ensuite facilities, we have a walk-in wardrobe with a seat and a dressing table, lots of drawers and shelving and hanging storage. Again, that's entirely bulkhead free, so it's a completely open plan. And if we make our way forward into what in the other hole would have been another cabin, what we have is a lovely lounge setup, perfectly placed to face across and enjoy those views, or to use this telly that raises out of that cabinet. That's very nice indeed. And of course, we do have a door, just the one down here, and that is for privacy in the ensuite, which is forward. And there we are, it's much the same in terms of headroom, in terms of fit out, in terms of scale, as the one we just saw in the starboard hull. So if you don't need to sleep 10 people, then this is a really indulgent kind of way to use the port hull. It's impressive, but it's not the most impressive sleeping accommodation on this boat, because of course, the owner is also well catered for. And as on the M48, that involves dropping the bridge deck forward and having a full beam cabin. So let's pop down there right now and take a look at that. Private stairwell to get down there, of course. And here we have a transverse double. Again, it's all beautifully open plan with a nice lounge on the starboard side. Some cabinets to separate the two sections off. Again, rather than bulkheads, we've got uh, kind of geometric stainless steel design features. Keeps everything feeling really beautiful and open. And there are little design flourishes everywhere you look, actually. I mean, this bed head could just be flat and straight and rather formulaic, but instead it's beautifully curved. And you have a couple of cabinets incorporated into that. Lovely big bed, loads of space. Lovely sense of openness. I don't want to say it feels a bit like a loft apartment because everyone tries to say that at the design stages, but it really does. Certainly how I imagine a loft apartment would look. Wherever you are in this cabin, you can see windows on either side. You can see the light flooding in. It keeps it wide open. And of course, you can shut off this bathroom by means of this sliding door. But rather cleverly, that's made of glass. So again, it doesn't shut things off. You have another glass door here leading you through to your walk-in wardrobe with hanging storage and shelves and extra drawers down below. And if we come into here, you'll see we've got his and hers sinks here. And the shower is split off from the toilet. 
which makes all kinds of sense. As you can see here, it being the master cabin, the owner's cabin, we have a rain shower and the toilet is further forward in this space, again through glass doors. So this is a spectacular owner's cabin. They talk about the M8 being a 65 footer that feels like an 85 footer and if there's any part of this boat that truly validates that then it's this. It's a magnificent space and a superb owner's cabin. This new Prestige M8 then, well it's not fast by any means, it's certainly not cheap either and actually some of the optional extras are quite offensively expensive in my view, particularly elements like that uh, lower helm and the aft passerelle. But it's certainly a better boat in all regards than that M48. It's more complete, more finished, better considered, and it's also more adventurous in its solutions, both to the day boating experience and to the cruising experience. Now the fit and finish, that's also on a different level, and so it should be because it's built in the same factory that used to produce Monte Carlo yachts, so they're well accustomed to building high level boats of this sort of scale and well beyond 65 feet. And it's worth mentioning also that this boat is better in pretty much every regard than most of the modified sailing cats that tend to litter this part of the market from various manufacturers who perhaps are not as willing to invest the time, the money and the effort in generating a fresh boat, a fresh power cat from the ground up. Now in terms of the boat's general livability, well there are social spaces all over this boat, loads of choice, loads of flexibility. In terms of the sleeping arrangements, they're very impressive. And again, as I say, there's lots of flexibility dialed into that too. And this M8, it also adds proper long range cruising capability, which is absolutely something that the M48 did not. Now, Erin Bamps, the boss here at Prestige, he's really keen to elevate the Prestige brand as it moves up in scale, up in size, and starts to compete with some of the really big boys. And in the form of the M8, I reckon he absolutely has the ideal stepping stone to help him achieve that. Mm -hmm.